They lied to us. They lied to all of us. The history books are wrong. The era of Queen Victoria isn't an era of prosperity for the British Empire. It isn't an era of prosperity for any empire. It is not even an era of humanity. It was the year 2025. When I went back in time, Mervinium doesn't allow its test subjects to use the internet in the past to post online and mess up the timeline, but I have to. I don't know when this post will reach the internet, as my phone can't lock on to one signal from one time. It might come to the public in the year 1999 or the year 2050. In the year 2024, a tech startup called Norvinium had unveiled the first prototype of the world's first working time machine, and they had recruited a hundred volunteers to test run it. I was one of them. Norvinium had run people through hundreds of vigorous exercises and tests to make sure that the people were safe when they went through the time travel. We were given special computers and phones that could catch a signal through time, which I am using right now to type this out. On the 13th of March, 2025, all 100 of them sat in their respective time machines and went off in time to 100 different time periods. I was selected to go to London in 1867, and I was pretty excited to do it. I was a history geek who especially loved aristocracy and the monarchy of many different countries, so getting to go to the era of one of the most famous monarchs of all time felt almost like a blessing to me. Oh, how naive I was. On the 13th of March, 2025, at exactly 2.13 p.m., I pressed the button in my time machine number 79 and fell through the timeline. I couldn't see anything. It felt like I was falling for many hours. When I reached the end of the timeline, I arrived in the year 1867 on the 14th of August at 2.30 p.m. The plan was for me to land in or near Portman Square before disembarking and exploring parts of London. However, what happened to me was part of no plan. It was nothing me or the team at Norvinium could have imagined. The place I had landed in looked different from what I knew of London in the 1860s. It sort of looked like the photos and the paintings, but it sort of didn't. All the shapes were there, all the textures were there, but there was no color. Everything was different shades of bright white. You could see textures and shapes, but the color was gone. Even the names of the places were wrong. A sign on the street said that the place was Queen Anne Street, but the place was a square that vaguely resembled Portman Square. The buildings were wrong and didn't match the photos I had seen. The city itself was completely empty. I was worried that something had gone wrong. Maybe I was in the wrong place or something. My mind even thought that I could be in the wrong timeline. Whatever that piece of science fictional thought meant, obviously this place was a far cry from the London that I had visited two years ago, but this wasn't the city of London that I had read about in history class either. I walked around the area, looking for any signs of life that I could find. There were a few shops that had the open sign hung, but had no one inside, not even the shopkeepers. I passed by a bakery that was displaying some sort of bread on the display window, but I didn't dare eat it or even touch it. Walking around I arrived at what should have been Oxford Street, but had a sign saying Pentonville Road. Exploring the place, I found that not a single door to any building or place was locked. I could enter any place I wanted to. A place was empty, but for record keeping, which I was told to do, I took pictures and videos of the city, and I started writing down about the things I saw, parts of which I'm using in this blog here. Being alone in such a huge city was, in a way, almost terrifying. I had not heard a sound, nor felt any wind, since I got here. I had fulfilled my quota of being in the past for at least an hour, and decided to go back. I turned around to go back to my time machine, but I couldn't. The signs had changed. It now read Uxbridge Road. Many of the buildings had changed. The path I had come from had been replaced by a huge building. I called my team back at Norvinium to let them know that I had been stranded and that I needed a rescue team immediately. But all of the rescue teams were busy. All of the 100 volunteers were in need of rescue from some situation that they had found themselves in. Help wouldn't be coming in at least for a few hours. As soon as I turned back around, I saw a figure moving towards me. He was wearing a brown colored coat and trousers. His skin was paper white and he had no face. Where his eyes were supposed to be were two red, glowing holes. He had no other facial features. 
When he neared me, I noticed that the clothes he was wearing appeared to be almost 10 sizes too big for him, almost like there was no body under those clothes, or the body he did have was thinner than a metal wire. I realized that he was really far away from me, but was moving towards me at an alarming rate. He was also humming in a strange tone that made me uneasy. He was not walking, but almost sliding towards me. His movement looked like one of those early 2000s video game movement where the walking animation would glitch out and not match the floor. Seeing him made me really terrified for some reason and I started running, but I felt that he would catch up to me. I ran inside what looked like a restaurant combined with a barber shop and closed the door behind me. As soon as I pulled down all the curtains, he caught up to the door and started beating on it. I pulled a couple of tables and chairs and stacked them to block the door. I sat down on the floor and started waiting for him to go away. I knew that something was horribly wrong with either history or the time machine, so I decided to violate Norvinian's NDA, and I sat down to write this experience down for the world to know. When I started writing it down, he was banging on the door, and as of when I'm writing this sentence down, the banging hasn't ended at all. I'm posting this for the world to see. And no, I hope that this post reaches the internet world after 2024 so that everyone might believe me. But if you're seeing this post come up before time machines were unveiled to the public by Norvinium, please believe me. I am extremely scared for my life and I do not know what to do. I'll try to wait out the creatures banging and hope it goes away before my rescue team arrives. I'm going to try to wait it out now. I'll be posting an update if something happens and my rescue team doesn't arrive, but I don't know if my update will be published at the correct date and time or will be displaced by years. I hope that it's at a time soon after the first one gets uploaded. Hopefully, Norvinium will just come and rescue me and just take legal action against me for the post so that I can't give you guys any update. Each bang gets louder than the previous one. Dad, someone please come and help me. I'm so scared. This isn't a normal world. This isn't a normal place. If this is truly Victorian London, then the history books are completely wrong. I don't know what's happening or what happened. All that I am certain of is that humans are not here in London in 1867. My sister. Oh God, I miss my sister, my wife, my daughter. How long has it been? I know that it's been more than just a few hours for me, but how long do I have to wait for them? Did they overshoot the date and time for the machine? Has there been a setback? Why aren't they just coming to pick me up at the moment I called or even arrived here? The banging is so loud now that I can even hear it in my thoughts. Thump, thump, thump. Oh God, what does that thing or that person or whatever want with me? I just want to go home. Day two, the light through the curtains has gone and come back. So I assume that it's been over a day. I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I have to eat something. My rescue still hasn't come and the banging hasn't stopped either. It feels as though my eardrums might explode. This is a restaurant, but everything looks weird. All the foods are white. The water available in the restaurant looks like milk. This is scary. Dad, I don't know if I can resist. The food and water smell completely normal, but I don't know if I should eat it. The banging on the door is almost deafening to my ears, making me want to stab my ears. I think I should explore this building. Day 3. This building is a two-floored one. I think I'll try to jump out from the second floor and jump the creature. I need to find a weapon. I think I'll go look in the kitchen. Day 4. I couldn't resist. I ate the white-colored food and drank the milky water. It tasted completely normal, almost fresh like. I found a butcher knife in the kitchen that I could use on the creature. I'm going to jump him. Day 5. What did I do? That thing that I stabbed, that I killed, was definitely not a human being. It was softer than a piece of jelly and its blood was darker and more viscous than tar. The face was completely featureless except for its eyes, which were extremely sharp. Touching his eyes cut my finger. I have to leave. Oh God, I have to go. I can't stay here. The area was completely different from how it looked like five days ago. The buildings were all different and there was a huge estate in front of me. It slightly resembled a palace or castle or something, maybe Kensington Palace or Buckingham. With everything being white, I cannot tell. I have no idea where to go, maybe inside the palace. The estate's walled off. It looks empty. If there are more of that thing, they can't follow me there. The gate is unlocked for some reason. 
just like every other door in this London is. The entrance is completely empty with no security or anything to stop me from entering the place. I immediately went inside the palace building to shield myself from any more of those creatures, if there are any. The inside of the palace was completely different from what I imagined. It looked like a normal palace. It wasn't white, just like everything outside. It was colored normally. There were shades of golden and white with red carpets on the ground. I went up the grand staircase and then inside one of the rooms, which appears to be a hall. In the corner on the carpet is what appears to be a red stained green hat and coat. Otherwise, the room looked immaculate, almost like it was cleaned recently. There was a table which was set for snacks and tea and the tea was still piping hot. It was still letting off steam. I touched the cup and it was still hot. Your Majesty, the Prime Minister, Lord Melbourne, is here. Came a voice. I was instantly taken aback and my flight or fight instincts kicked in. Was it another creature like that I encountered? Or was it another person? In walked a woman. She was wearing a red era appropriate gown that almost looked like it belonged to the Royal Guard. But something was weird. The gown looked like jelly, like no fabric I had seen before. Uh, your Majesty, the Prime Minister is waiting for you. He says he has some urgent business, she said. The person moved towards me and I instinctively walked back crashing into the table, spilling piping hot tea on me, the burn searing my back. Your Majesty, are you okay? You should immediately change your outfit, lest it seeps through the clothing and burns you, said the person. Don't come near me, just stay away. Who are you? I screamed. Drina, please do not make a fuss. There is an urgent issue that the Prime Minister needs your attention to. He's calling to you. He's in net of you, said the person. Who are you? I'm not the queen. And what's that bloody outfit? In the corner, I screamed at the person. Why her? That's Queen Elizabeth II, ma'am. She didn't like the tea and biscuits too much, you know. That's what you get when you don't like the food the real queen provides you, said the woman. How in the world was Queen Elizabeth in 1867? My mind started going haywire. Is something wrong? Am I going crazy? Am I in a parallel universe or something? I don't usually believe in such conspiracy theories, but this is too much for me to understand. Take me to my room to change. Tell Lord Melbourne to wait a few moments, I said sheepishly, and then left the room. Of course, your majesty, right this way, she said. I followed her to a section of the palace and entered another room with a bed. I need some privacy while I change. Wait outside, I said. Of course, ma'am, I'll send for the headdresser, she said. No, I'll be fine. I need some privacy, I said. And then I closed the door behind me. What in the world is going on? I need to contact Morvinium and check for Queen Elizabeth II's status. I tried to contact them on my phone, but no one picked up. My signal was really unstable. That shouldn't happen. The phone should be able to pick up mobile signals throughout the whole timeline. I need to get out of this place. I don't know what is going on or if I am safe at all. There's another door and I'm leaving through it. I opened the door, peeking out into the hallway. Your Majesty, what are you doing? You still haven't changed. I guess you'll have to go out like this. I'll have to ask the Prime Minister not to mention this to anyone. Do come quickly. The Prime Minister is waiting for you. He says he has some urgent business. She repeated. What the hell? Why the hell do you keep repeating that sentence? over and over again. Where is the Prime Minister? Where is everyone? I haven't seen anyone other than you in those bloody clothing in this whole palace. I'm not going with you at all. I'm leaving this place. I yelled that as strongly as my weak throat could handle. But your majesty, you can't leave. The Prime Minister is waiting for you. I threw a hairbrush from the room at her face. Her face dented like a cheap plastic toy after you hit it with a hammer. He says he has some urgent business. It seems that you wish to shirk your duty. As the Queen of the British Empire, well, I will not allow it. Her voice started changing to a raspier tone, and she started turning paler. All of her facial features started going away, except for the eyes, which started turning into glowing holes. It's that thing again. It must be playing tricks with me here in the palace. The creature's hands turn pointy and sharp, like a spear. I throw a candelabra at it, hoping to attack it as I am sick of the creature attacking me. The creature did not anticipate it and is hit, but the candle bounces off of it and falls to the carpet, setting it on fire. 
Just like regular plastic, the creature starts melting quickly. I run towards the entrance of the palace in case the fire spreads. I open the door and go outside. A significant portion of the palace has caught on fire. The smoke has started spreading, exiting out of two areas, one of which was near where I was and another at the end of the palace. The palace itself is burning as well. I see them. I see more of them. Hundreds of them. Thousands of them. There are so many of that creature dressed in human clothing, all of them without faces, some of them without arms or legs, but all of them in the streets of the city outside of the garden. They're all looking at me. They want to get in the palace grounds. They want to kill me. I can't go back inside the palace for shelter. It's burning, and I can't go through the front gate. I'm stuck here. I'll probably die here. They're going to kill me. They'll get in soon. There's no point in resisting. I'll just sit on the ground, I guess, and wait to die. I close my eyes and lie on the ground. I wait for them to breach the tall fence wall and just kill me. When I open them, I find myself back inside the palace. The entirety of the building is burning. Someone had dragged me back in. Such brutality. Huh, it's almost as if you have some sort of a mental illness. You should have agreed to see me. Now, you've killed over two of us. You killed Baroness Lazen. You killed one of the citizens of London. I was willing to let go of one random civilian, but not a member of the royal household. You will have to be brought to a trial. What? Trial? Who are you anyway? What are you doing in London? What did you do with the humans who were supposed to be here anyway? If I am a murderer, what the hell are you then? I said, hey, I'm the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Henry William Lamb, the second Viscount Melbourne, at your service. Melbourne, I know history and you're definitely not him. You look nothing like him. The person in front of me had an eye patch, a dark olive skin, and blonde hair. He looked nothing like the history books showed Lord Melbourne to look like. I'm not the Melbourne your people know. That Melbourne doesn't exist anymore. One of your co-testers messed up. The entire world is different. Why did your people not come to save you? Because the tester made them not exist anymore. No, that's not possible. If we made our company not exist anymore, then there would be no time machine invented, and no one would be able to go back in time, and the log I've been writing would not be able to be posted to the internet. I said, really, I guess. Sometimes still haven't yet been replaced by the new timeline. When the ripple effect happened, thank you for making us aware of these pockets of time that still host the original timeline. Physics always prefer the natural order, but this new artificial timeline will prevail. I would like to thank you people for creating us. The new timeline is for us to live in. Humanity is gone forever and Earth is for us now. Thank you for your time machine. We now have something to use to gather up all the remaining 100 humans now, plus any other time that still hasn't been replaced by the new timeline. Now, you will be executed for your crimes against two citizens of the British Empire. Guards, take him away, said Melbourne. Two of the white colored creatures come and grab me by my shoulders, dragging me out of the burning palace. They're going towards the door, towards the entrance. They're taking me towards the crowd. They are extremely strong, and no matter how much I resist, I cannot escape or even protest. They put me in a wagon, driving me off to somewhere. I have absolutely no hope of getting out alive from here. After a ride that lasted for many long hours, I was thrown out in front of what looked like a huge building. One of the guards said to another creature at the entrance of the building, take him to the judge. She will decide what will be done with this filthy human. The creature had no mouth, and the voice will come from the two glowing holes on his face. The creature at the entrance came up and dragged me into the building. The inside looked like a church, but the altar was replaced by a table and chair where a creature sat wearing a black dress that vaguely resembled a court dress. Its face was completely still, like a statue. As I was dragged towards it, a wave of fear started to come over me. Fear, unlike anything I had ever felt before. I was in an almost paralysis-like state, unable to move from fear. I was going to die. I am one of the last humans left. The people reading this are somehow in a time bubble, but will be killed soon. I was dragged and literally thrown on the desk in front of the creature. The judge creature took a look at me, and without any hesitation for even a second, simply said, execution, tomorrow, in a monotonous tone. 
I am in a cell right now, writing this. As I write this sentence, I am hearing extremely loud noises of someone or something talking about me being killed in a few hours. I am writing and sending this post to warn everyone in the bubble of an attack. If I am still alive, I will write more posts to tell the remaining world in the time bubble about these creatures. But if there are no more logs, please forgive me as I did not make it. Ever since I came here, I have been running from something or have been under attack from someone. I only miss my wife, my daughter, and my sister. I do not know if they're still even living. Maybe they have been wiped out with the timeline change. Or maybe the bubble is close enough to 2025 that they're still alive, even at a different age. Anyways, I see one of the creatures coming towards me with an axe. This time, I know I will not make it. I am sorry. I truly am. I couldn't do anything more to help everyone. Just be prepared for them, for when they attack, my body feels weak and disoriented. I have crash landed and am stuck in the past. Please save my soul. This post has been written to tell Norvinium to come save me quickly. I hope that this message reaches them. It's supposed to be January 1920 Varanasi, India during the British Raj. My time machine number 23 has crash landed and isn't functioning properly. It feels like it is a small, narrow alley where I've landed. The alley looks empty and the time appears somewhere around midnight. I was supposed to land at the Dashishwe Magat on the banks of the River Ganga, but it looks as if I might have landed in one of its alleys. The city must be sleeping, as I do not see anyone when I leave the alley to the riverbank. I had assumed that in such a populated city, I would see at least a few people even in the dead of night, but apparently not. I call my rescue team at Norvinium to come pick me up and take the time machine back. They say that they'll arrive in an hour since there are many requests from almost half of the volunteer testers and counting needed rescue. Waiting for pickup, I decided to explore the city. Walking alongside the riverbank brought me to many historical places and places that I recognized. I was born in the city of Varanasi in the year 1990. It looked like the city hadn't changed much, at least on the banks. That made sense, as these places have a huge historical and religious importance, and the place would not be completely changed by the government ever. The river looked different though. The river was not water. It was solid white and felt like jelly. The river was misshapen and was not flat at all like a normal river. It almost looked like pieces of the white jelly was stacked one by one on top of each other. I dared not touch it for more than a second at the foot of the pile. There were hundreds of piles of various sizes and shapes, the biggest being around 5 feet over the riverbank, and parts of them were moving. There were protrusions in many places that were moving in different directions and speeds, repeating one single motion over and over again. This was not normal. There was no water in the river. It was not ice. And anyway, there couldn't be any ice in this 30 degree Celsius weather. I kicked the jelly at the corner of the pile, and a pocket of it deflated, oozing out a thick, dark, viscous substance, which I immediately backed away from. I backed away from the river to get away from the jelly-like substance. I decided to enter the city interior. Through the Munchie Gat, I enter some alleyways which open up to an area called the Bengali Tola. I had never previously been here even when I lived in the city, but I had heard that it was an area of Varanasi where the people of Bengal lived that had a college, and a school, and some shops, but there was something completely different from what anything that's possible in a city in India. All the buildings in the area were made completely of platinum and had an architectural style that I didn't recognize. The buildings were completely plain, with no art design or visible features to them. They were all just plain walls with door frames made of silver, with not even a door in them. I entered one of the buildings, but the inside was just one room. There was a bed, but it was as hard as stone, even though it looked like a normal Indian cot bed made of rope. There was nothing else in the room, except for a huge radio, which I turned on. There was music playing, but it definitely wasn't Indian, or British, actually sounding kind of robotic and futuristic. I exit the building, but I'm no longer in the area. I originally was. I was back on the river banks of the city. Somehow, I had been transported back to the riverfront area. Was I drugged? The place in itself looked completely weird and different from what it should have been. The night was passing and dawn was about to break. I recognized the area as the Asi Gat or the 80th Gat. 
this area was considered to be the end of historical Varanasi, and any further would be later constructions. I realized that it had been over an hour and my help still hadn't arrived, so I started walking back to the Dash Ishwe to pick up my phone and laptop, which I had left in there, to contact Norvinium again. By the time I reached the time machine, dawn had broken and I assumed that the people would be coming out soon. I called Norvinium, but they weren't picking up. I had a spare change of clothes and the machine that was era appropriate, so I changed into them and started walking back towards the Ghats. I had only worn a sari a few times before in my life, even as an Indian, so wearing it made me feel a little uncomfortable. I sat down on the Ghat steps and decided to start writing my logs for record keeping as said by Norvinium. I checked on my phone and the time was 7 a.m. When I started writing, suddenly I heard a huge rumble. Was it an earthquake? No, Varanasi doesn't have earthquakes of this magnitude ever. The river was shaking, the jelly was shaking, a piece detached from the main body of the jelly and shaped itself into a humanoid shape. One by one, from all the piles of the substance in the river, pieces started to detach themselves and take shape. The pieces started leaving the river and walking towards the city. There were thousands that I could see with the naked eye, but I would not be surprised if the pieces were in the millions extending throughout the whole city. I ran and hid in an alley behind the get. The creatures had no face and only glowing eye sockets. They barely had a body which looked like a bunch of wires in the shape of legs and arms. It's hard to describe. It's like when you doodle a human but draw only one line for the main body and two protruding lines from the shoulder for the hands and two lines from halfway down the main body for the legs. That is how their bodies looked except at the end of the wires, they did have complete legs and arms. A lot of them were walking towards the alley. I was hiding in, so I went deeper inside. I went inside a building, but it didn't have doors, just an open door frame. None of the buildings in this alley did, just like the buildings in the Bengali Tola. Although I'm hidden behind a tall table made of silver, I am extremely scared. Outside of the building, one of them was talking to another. It said, one of us was killed during the night. The other replied, no one could have done that. Everyone was asleep. I know, but I saw it myself. Someone else is here, the first one said. Why hadn't my rescue come till now? I needed answers for what's happening. I saw a log posted by one of my fellow test subjects number 79 about his situation in London. He was stuck inside a building, just like me, but he had a door to keep the creatures off, and he escaped to a palace. I too decided to write a log about what's happening in Varanasi, India in the year 1920, which I am posting right now. Hundreds of those creatures are outside the building, walking around. If any one of them comes inside, they might kill me. Dear God, please save me, and know that if I do not post any update, I am dead. To all my fellow test subjects, based on what I saw, I believe that these creatures are more vulnerable during the night. They physically cannot move during the night and can only repeat the last hand and leg actions that they were performing before they turned into jelly and get stuck to each in clumps. If you get attacked by one of these creatures, know that it is easier to deal with them during the night. I hope that even if I die, others might make it. Number 66, if you're reading this, you went the furthest in the past, so please investigate the cause of this weird history changing phenomenon. To my family, I love you. I leave all of my worldly possessions to my brother. If anything happens to me, please remember me and keep me in your heart. Goodbye. Number 23 is dead. Number 54 is dead. Number 87 is missing and hasn't responded in over two hours. Number 3 is stranded in her time period. Number 1, number 12, number 35, number 81, number 32, number 13, number 4, and many others are also not responding to my texts and communications. This is number 66. I am still in the Devonian era. What I've done cannot be erased anymore. The only thing that I can do is to go to the new London and destroy the working time machine I know they have gotten hold of. Many of my fellow test subjects have already destroyed their time machines. Hopefully, that will give me more time to fix the situation. I get back in my time machine and change the dials to 1867 on the 14th of August at 2 p.m., just 30 minutes before number 79 was supposed to arrive. 
I arrive at Portman Square, Queen Anne Street on the rooftop of a small building inside which I hide. It was a glass workshop that looked like it was frozen in time. The furnace was still warm, but not hot. There were pieces and sheets of glass everywhere. I looked into a mirror lying on the ground, propped up against a wall. I was wearing my favorite green coat and cap. I was stomy. My medium-sized hair came up to my shoulders. My makeup was in ruins though. Looking around the building, I found a washroom where I washed my face. My sister would be disappointed in me, I know. She was one of those types who always told me a woman's biggest feature is her face. She should always keep it pretty. Well, keeping my face pretty isn't going to help me here right now. I take up a position behind a window, looking for number 79. I knew 79, Eddie. He was a nice guy, a bit blunt-headed though. The team gave him many nicknames. Pretty boy, idiot, hothead. His wife often came to meet him during the tests, almost every day. Sometimes his daughter did too. I'm sorry that I can't save him. One of the things that we learned during our orientation was not to interfere with another time traveler, ever. Never to make your presence known to them. Time otherwise could split apart. As the clock strikes 2.30 p.m. on my watch, I hear a quiet noise, like a distant bang, outside of my window. I look outside and see him. He landed on the street and walked out and left the time machine in the open. Damn as idiocy. I know he was shocked and surprised, but that was breaking protocol. As I go down the stairs to get near the time machine, I see that a few of the creatures, or new humans as I think I will call them, are taking the machine away in a crane of some sort. I follow them, making sure to keep my distance. After walking for what felt like just five minutes, I realized that I was in front of a palace. I kept my gaze at the machine as the new humans unchained it from the crane and pushed it inside the back entrance of the palace. I didn't have anything to destroy the machine with. What I had was a plan. In the year 2020, Norvinium's founder, Mark Terence, is a PhD student in Paris, learning theoretical physics. I will send the machine to his apartment and set it to explode, killing him. Using my laptop, I find out where his home was and set the machine to those coordinates. After setting up the machine, I go back to the palace and enter it through its back entrance. Slowly walking through the narrow hallway, I find myself in front of some stairs that lead to the basement of the palace. I go down the stairs and into the basement. The basement is different from a typical basement than you would expect. It's huge, it's humongous. I feel like I might get lost walking around here and walk for an entire eternity and still not find the time machine. It's a big room where the walls are completely pitch black. There are items in the room, like a broken chair and some boxes and they look completely normal but against the backdrop of the pitch black walls, they almost look like they're floating. I walk in a straight line for what feels like an hour, but my watch indicates that it's been less than two minutes. I still haven't found the end of the room. I was walking alongside one of the walls where I would feel pitch black doors that I would open and check. Inside the doors were small rooms that had normal walls and various other types of objects. But then I hear something, it's footsteps. I turn around to see a woman facing me. She was wearing a blue colored gown that looked like it was made of jelly. So, you're Baroness Lazen. I say that with an obvious tone of sarcasm and finger quotes. How did you know that? Are you another one of the old humans? Are you like that other person who is screaming and crying inside a building while one of my subordinates is making him crap the pants out of them? You look much braver than him, said the new human. I know you're not really her. So why this act? Why this face? I say, Morim. Why? Because it's fun. But anyway, as part of my fun, I think I'll give you a name. I'm a Baroness, and I serve Queen Victoria. But I've already decided that that other person will be Victoria. So, what should I call you? I got it, Your Majesty, Queen Elizabeth. I like it. I am a humble servant in the royal household. Do you any orders for me? But be careful what you tell me to do, Lazen said. I cannot find any words. Even amongst the new humans, this one is an oddity. Reading through the logs of many of my fellow test subjects, I hadn't found one that you could call insane exactly, but this one seems to be. No orders for me. Then I have some for you, ma'am, die. She screamed. As the new human Lazen showed its real form, I started to run. One by one, I looked through the doors to find the time machine. 
She would keep on running after me. I knew I couldn't harm her in any way that would hinder her from showing up in front of number 79 to maintain the timeline. She emitted a deafening screech that caused noises of glass shattering to start. Finally, I found the time machine in a room. I locked the door behind me and set up the machine to self-explode. After that, I sit in a corner of the room and start to write this log as a diary of sorts in the room, hoping that someone would remember me. Even if they do not believe this log, Lazen is trying to break the door. The hinges are already loose and the door has a big crack in it. I don't think that I will make it. Hopefully, my time machine will kill Mark Terrence in his home. I hope that this will help fix my mistake. I'm sorry that to fix my mistake, someone else has to die, but that is just how it has to be. This will fix the time bubble, and history will go back to normal. It has to. I hope it will. Goodbye.